Thank you very much for joining for another regular daily press conference regarding novel coronavirus from WHO headquarters here in Geneva. Welcome to all journalists present here in the room. I see some new faces. Welcome to WHO. Welcome to journalists who are joining us either online or uh, uh, through phone line. And uh, welcome to everyone watching us on WHO Twitter account. Today uh, with us uh, we have uh, Dr. Tedros, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director of WHO Health Emergency Program, and Dr. Sylvie Brian, Director for Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness here at WHO. Before, before I give a floor to Dr. Tedros, uh, we are using the same system as we, we, as we used on Saturday. It means those who are uh, watching us online, journalists online through Zoom, uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, please click on the raise hand on the right-hand side of your screen. And those who dialed in through phone line, uh, please uh, type star 9 on your keypad and you will be put in the queue for questions. As always, we will have an uh, audio file and transcript from this press briefing. Uh, Dr. Chadros, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as usual, I will start with uh, the latest numbers of uh, coronavirus. As of uh, 6 a.m. Geneva time today, there were 40,235 confirmed cases in China and 909 deaths. Outside China, there are 319 cases in 24 countries and one death. The overall pattern has not changed. 99% of the reported cases are in China, and most cases are mild. About 2% of cases are fatal, which of course is still too many. A lot of people are asking, where is the outbreak going? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? We're doing several things to answer those questions. First, the meeting on research and innovation starting tomorrow will identify some of those questions and chart a path uh, forward. Second, an advanced team of WHO experts has just arrived in China, led by Dr. Bruce Eilward, to lay the groundwork for the larger international team. Bruce in, and his colleagues will be working with their Chinese counterparts to make sure we have the right expertise on the team to answer the right questions. We're grateful for the many people who have volunteered their expertise from all over the world. In recent days, we have seen some concerning instances of onward transmission from people with no travel history to China, like the cases reported in France yesterday and the United Kingdom today. The detection of this small number of cases could be the spark that becomes a bigger fire. But for now, it's only a spark. Our objective remains containment. We call on all countries to use the window of opportunity we have to prevent a bigger fire. As part of those preparations, WHO is working to equip laboratories with the capacity to rapidly diagnose cases. Without vital diagnostic capacity, countries are in the dark as to how far and wide the virus has spread and who has coronavirus or another disease with similar symptoms. We have now identified 168 labs around the world with the right technology to diagnose coronavirus. We have sent kits to Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, Egypt, Ethiopia, Gabon, Ghana, Iran, Kenya, Morocco, Nigeria, Tunisia, Uganda, and Zambia. Many of those countries have already started using them. 
Another shipment of 150,000 tests is being assembled in Berlin today and is destined for more than 80 labs in all regions globally. Last week, the African CDC conducted training in Senegal with 12 countries using tests sent by WHO, and further training will take place in South Africa next week. WHO will continue working with all countries to prevent and detect rapidly new cases of coronavirus and to save lives. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. So we will uh, start immediately with questions. As always, we will start here in a room and then we will go to our colleagues online. Please, one question per journalist so we can try to take as many as possible. To Mark and Gabriela, please. Uh, yes, I have a if you can just take a microphone. Sorry, it's just here. There. We have a rowing mic for today. Thank you. Hi. Hi, this is uh, Liu from China Xinhua News Agency. News Agency. Uh, two questions. Sorry. Um, one, okay, one question. Okay, um, uh, does WHO has any comments on the reports, the latest reports that, that there is a breakthrough in, uh, in research about the virus that uh, uh, researchers in uh, Australia, the, South New, um, the New South Wales, I, I guess, uh, they have uh, successful, uh, successfully managed to um, obtain live uh, virus from, uh, from the patients instead of uh, synthesized samples. Uh, does uh, does that help uh, in any way to uh, quickly detect the virus and diagnosis, uh, uh, judging from the uh, WHO's point of view? Thank you. To have sensitized the virus? Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. Question. Can you repeat just the question, please? Yes, there are latest reports uh, from the uh, Australian. The Australian uh, health authorities from New South Wales, uh, the researchers have success successfully uh, managed to obtain a live coronavirus from uh, uh, infected patients instead of synthesize the uh, samples from lab laboratory. Does uh, WHO know that or had any comments on that? Okay. Sure. I think uh, yep. a number it's of labs good. have isolated the virus now around the world, so I think, uh, and are actively sharing the virus as well. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> it's really important that we have multiple isolations. The sequencing of the virus is very important and allows us to track the sequence, but being able to isolate the virus itself provides the basis for both therapeutic and vaccine development, uh, <clears throat> as well as the development of diagnostic assays, particularly serology, which we need right now. And having live virus is very important for developing the neutralizing tests and other things we need to test for the presence of the antibodies to the virus, which will allow us to look at population attack rates, not just look at who's been infected and who's been sick, but to potentially look at a broader uh, proportion of the population to see if there are milder cases out there that we're not detecting. So live isolation of the virus allows a huge advance in, in diagnostics and potential advances in therapeutics and, and vaccine development. But uh, the virus has been isolated for a good while now, and many labs have done that. The viral culture of the virus in laboratories is indeed a, a next step, I mean, uh, uh, to the normal diagnostic, which is based on, on PCR. And it's, it's uh, indeed uh, very important because when you have, for example, the genetic sequence is like having the ID card of the virus, but not the virus itself. So here with having the virus in hand, it's uh, indeed uh, much better to make testing and to um, uh, make probes against uh, therapeutics or vaccines. Thank you. Uh, Mark, please. Yeah, uh, Mark Webster, CDTN. Could you give us an idea of what the priorities are for your team on the ground now in China? And are you satisfied that they will get full cooperation from the authorities there? Yeah. Um, the, the team is there, uh, first and foremost, to learn and to understand uh, not only the investigations uh, that have been carried out so far in China, but also to understand the nature of what has been one of the largest public health responses in history in China. So we both learn more about the virus, to learn more about the investigations that have been carried out by, by Chinese scientists and epidemiologists, to understand the nature of the public health response, which reaches right from the lowest level in the community right the way through the system to the top. So there are huge lessons to be learned from that experience. Uh, but immediately, uh, obviously, <clears throat> understanding 
better. Uh, issues around the origin, source of the virus, issues around severity of the disease, uh, answering all of those questions. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, many of the ongoing investigations, which are actually being implemented by Chinese scientists, are getting those answers. We will be able to, by sending very senior, eminent people, create a collaboration and exchange of ideas that will allow those investigations to be even better. But I, I think primarily and first and foremost, it must be seen that this is a, a, an, investiga an investigation to, to, to learn uh, and support China. But also, many of those scientists have been collaborating externally and internally. Many of these people actually know each other already. This is not a, a voyage into the dark. This is going to reconnect with scientists that we're already working with on a day-to-day -day basis over many, many years. So this is about increasing the levels of cooperation, uh, not establishing cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabriela, you had a question? Yes. Sure. Thank you. No, please no. use that microphone ah. over there. Oh. Okay. Sorry, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Gabriela Sotomayor, Mexico. Uh, I have a question on the forum that uh, will begin here uh, at WHO tomorrow, the experts. Uh, are you inviting experts from Taiwan to be here in Geneva? Because uh, you know that China said that they invited experts to Wuhan, to the epicenter of the, of the outbreak, but they had limited access. They weren't allowed to go to the market, for example. So I'm wondering that considering that Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's ge geographical proximity and frequent people-to-people -people exchange with China, uh, they have so, uh, so far 17 cases. So they have different health systems. And my question is uh, maybe they have something to share with the international community. So are they going to be physically here in Geneva? Are you inviting them? Thank you. Um. We will have a number of Taiwanese colleagues online as uh, the conference is grossly, uh, greatly oversubscribed. In fact, uh, there's a huge number of people dialing in. And mainly a lot of those people dialing in are people who are in the front line themselves. So we have to be very careful in bringing scientists together that we don't uh, uh, disrupt the response itself. So a lot of colleagues from around the world are both uh, coming in by WebEx, by telephone, and will be online for, for the deliberations. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to that, we've, uh, as I said in previous teleconferences, have been engaging with technical colleagues on the Taiwanese side for over the whole course of this event, including following up on probable cases in Europe, multiple teleconferences, and we continue to engage Taiwanese colleagues and colleagues on the Chinese mainland in all aspects of technical cooperation in order to better understand this disease. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move online for a few colleagues who are dialing in. Uh, CNBC, can we hear you? Can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, yes. Thank you for taking my question. This is Dawn Kopecki. My question is regarding the mortality rate and the time frame with which it takes this virus to uh, be lethal enough for someone to die from it. Um, it's two weeks from transmission to symptoms in many cases, and then how long does it take? Some doctors here are saying that the disease kills people at a slower rate or a slower pace than SARS, but they're not sure that the mortality rate that we're seeing now is the mortality rate we'll be dealing with in three, four, five months. So can you talk about how long it takes for someone to get sick enough to die from this and then what that says about the mortality rates we're seeing now and what we might see in three or four months? For that question, let's see if uh, yeah. we can take it. So I think um, um, what we have now is a better view of how many people are um, have mild disease. Uh, it's around 80%. Uh, how many people are of a severe disease, mostly a pneumonia that uh, requires hospitalization. From the latest data, it's around 15%. And uh, also it's around also 3 to 4% uh, uh, of people who will need, uh, f 3 to 5% of people will need uh, um, intensive care. Um, so what will make a difference in terms of mortality is really uh, the underlying condition of the patient. And uh, if uh, this patient will uh, have a very critical uh, illness or not. 
And this is why uh, people who are uh, transferred to intensive care units may stay much longer in the hospital because they have, um, they can receive um, a very uh, sophisticated care. And therefore, it takes some time longer for them not only to um, recover from uh, this very severe disease, but after uh, ICU, when they are transferred to normal ward, then they need uh, more time to recover as well. So the range of hospitalization may vary a lot depending on, on the uh, status of the patient and their age and their underlying conditions. Um, what, when you compare with SARS, uh, we have also to uh, recognize that since SARS, uh, the medicine has done a lot of progress. We have now uh, new technologies such as ECMO that allow also to um, save uh, more severe patients. And so these technologies are uh, uh, really important as well to explain why people may stay longer in a hospital because they are benefiting from uh, uh, much better care than maybe what we could afford uh, two decades ago. I think it's important uh, in, in reflecting on that that the, the health system in China is sophisticated and is capable of delivering high levels of intensive care. And when you consider that uh, 90 to 100 percent of patients in hospital require supplemental oxygen, uh, 20 to 25 percent of those patients re require intensive care and 5 to 10 percent of patients may require some form of mechanical ventilation. Uh, that's a huge demand on a system, um, uh, that much. Uh, so it's a, it's a tremendous achievement that so many patients can be kept alive. But there is a lag, and some of those patients will, will, will die, and that's a very unfortunate thing. But uh, again, reflecting on what the Director General has said many times before, uh, imagine this disease establishing itself within a weaker health system without those capacities, without those capabilities, and that's what we've been calling for. This disease may appear relatively mild in the context of a sophisticated health system. That may not be the case should this disease reach a system that is not as capable as that of China. Thank you very much. Let's take one more uh, from online. We have someone from Montreal in Canada. Can you hear us? Can you introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. My name is Jean-Benoît Legault. I am with the Canadian Press in Montreal, Canada. Uh, if possible, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Brian a question in French. Um, Dr. Brian, j'aurais aimé obtenir des précisions concernant la situation à bord du navire de croisière qui est en quarantaine au large du Japon. Est-ce que vous pourriez m'expliquer comment la quarantaine est appliquée dans une situation comme celle-là? Est-ce qu'on recommence à zéro à chaque fois qu'une nouvelle infection est détectée? Comment c'est géré ce genre de situation-là habituellement? Translate this for everyone. So it's a question about uh, quarantine rules for people on board of a cruise ship. Uh, are we starting always the new uh, quarantine period every time the new infection is being detected, Dr. Brian? Oui, merci pour cette question. Alors, euh, en fait, ce qui se passe à bord de, de ce bateau, euh, la Princess Dime, Diamond Princess, euh, c'est effectivement que quand euh, les cas ont été diagnostiqués euh, parmi les passagers, les personnes qui étaient, euh, euh, qui étaient euh, positives euh, lors du test ont donc été évacuées et hospitalisées euh, euh, sur le, le continent, donc euh, ne sont pas restées à bord. Par contre, les autres personnes qui sont restées à bord du bateau, euh, on, on leur a demandé donc de rester le plus possible dans leur chambre, dans leur cabine. Et s'ils devaient sortir de leur cabine, se munir de masques. Euh, et donc, les tests sont faits régulièrement sur ces personnes. Donc, normalement, euh, la période de quarantaine devrait se terminer le 19 février. Mais on est en train de, de travailler avec les autorités sanitaires et aussi euh, les personnels qui sont euh, en train de réaliser l'investigation sur le bateau pour euh, voir euh, comment euh, on pourrait euh, euh, aller de l'avant euh, en termes de quarantaine pour euh, à la fois respecter euh, le droit des personnes et leur permettre de, de, de pouvoir euh, circuler librement et en même temps s'assurer que le risque de transmission euh, est vraiment euh, minimal, voire inexistant. Donc euh, c'est euh, actuellement les, les les interactions qu'on a avec les autorités sanitaires pour euh, trouver la meilleure mesure possible. C'est juste aussi pour préciser, quand il y a des, des nouveaux cas, c'est juste les contacts de ces nouveaux cas qui commencent encore le, le 14 jours. 
Okay. So, ce n'est pas tout le bateau. C'est quand, quand il y a des autres cas, c'est les, juste les contacts euh, précoces de, de cette cas qui commencent encore euh, le, le 14 juillet. Very quick one in English for for rest of the journalists. So currently, um, so what happens is that the people who were uh, found positive have been hospitalized, so they are not anymore on the ship, and the people who uh, have been uh, contact, I mean the rest of the the, um, the travelers, uh, are uh, checked regularly, um, and um, and so when when a case a new case is found on the ship. Uh, then only the close contact of this person are uh, considered for uh, additional quarantine. But otherwise, the uh, quarantine for the rest of the uh, travelers is supposed to end on 19 February. Thank you very much for this uh, translation. We'll go back to the room. Uh, start with uh, Jamie, then we have Shane, and then one more here. Uh, Jamie, can you just please grab that uh, rowing mic? Can, can someone the please pass the, 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 the mic? To uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Jamie, Associated Press. Um, Dr. Tedros, um, I'd like to go back to the case of the that happened in France and in, in the, ca the recent cases. Um, how concerned are you that we may be seeing a super spreader emerge? Um, what what exactly is that, and what could that? Um, how could that be defeated? And then, just in a similar note, sorry, it's a, it's the same thought, <laughs> Derek. Um, is that? Um, there are conferences that are happening all over the world. How concerned are you, including one that's going to happen here tomorrow, um, how concerned are you that conferences may be a place where super spreaders could emerge from? Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. If we can just get a microphone toward mm -hmm. this, air, this, this area. Yeah. Um, on, the, uh, on the event in Singapore, no, I think it's way too early and, and much more of an exaggeration to consider the, the Singapore conference event uh, a super uh, spreading event. Um, the events uh, in Singapore at the moment, I think, is about 40 confirmed cases, 21 associated with uh, import uh, from China, 19 locally acquired with no history of uh, transport. The Singapore conference cluster has uh, 12 uh, cases associated with it. Uh, those five you mentioned, Jimmy, in, in, in Singapore, or in France, the, the three in Singapore itself, and then Korea, Malaysia, and the United Kingdom. But those numbers are ones. So we're not dealing here with a super spreading event, uh, people comparing it to the Amoy Gardens or to, to the Metropole Hotel or any of that. But, but certainly it is always a concern when people come together and then move apart, and we have to have uh, risk management procedures uh, associated with that. But you can't shut down the world either. Uh, normal activity must go on. So what we need to see is reasonable, well-managed uh, meetings and gatherings in which the risks are managed appropriately. Uh, we're not going to uh, be in a position to say on the slightest possibility that there may be possibly an infection associated with NCOV that we're going to cancel every event. Otherwise, we cancel these press conferences and we wouldn't be able to speak to you. So wh where is the limit to this? So I think we need to remain calm. We need to be measured. We need to be driven by risks. First, we need to identify those risks and look at those events one by one and see, okay, what are the risks? How can those risks be minimized? There is no zero risk in anything in life. Uh, you may trip on the stairs going out of here. It's a risk. So, uh, uh, so I think we need to take a risk management approach, accept there's no zero risk, and do our best to ensure that we ensure the safety of people attending all gatherings around the world. And I think also what is very important is to talk about super spreading event and not people. Because it's not the person, it's really the circumstances and the situation that makes the transmission uh, uh, increase and not the people themselves so that uh, we avoid also some stigmatization that is really unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we had one question here, if you can just please give the mic and then we, we, we will have it, we will try. If you have short one question, we will be able to, to get everyone. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ken. I'm from the Japanese newspaper Yomiuri. Um, I'd like to come back to the uh, international expert team. Um, can you elabor elaborate a little bit more about um, their uh, time frame of work and how many people are there for the advanced team? Where are they working? I, su I assume it's Beijing, but you haven't mentioned it. And um, how many people are you expecting for the uh, team altogether? Um, 
the advanced team is already there uh, and um, they will prepare everything for the rest of the team and we hope the rest of the team will join them as uh, soon as uh, possible and the team could range between 10 and 15 but we're aiming for 10 actually to make it as manageable as possible uh, so if need be we can increase but it will be around 10 so that means additional seven. And where are they working? Of course, they will have a plan. Oh, no, no. Where? Where? They will have a plan. <laughs> they will organize a plan based on the discussion with their counterparts. What to visit, when to visit, and where to visit, and where to focus, what kind of issues, which unanswered questions to answer, and, and so on. So we, we have fully empowered them. We don't want to tell them to do this or that. And that's what we told the advanced team. Because these are experienced people, and they know what to do. So we want them to be really free, empowered, and see things for themselves, and then uh, you know, uh, tell us you know, answers to the questions that we still, we, still, we still have. So we wouldn't say anything now, because they're... Uh, you know, they're not like told to say this or to do that because they have to have a free thinking and they they have to operate with full responsibility and empowerment. And we have fully empowered them. Thank, Thank you. you. Much, uh, DG, let's go. Shane, you had a question. Please take a mic, please. Then we go to the colleague. There. Shane from China Central Television. I also have the tip. My question is also about the Alliance team and the international experts. Can you share more about their backgrounds? Like which backgrounds are they targeting? Like what what are their priority? Like vaccines a priority? Or the transmitter is a priority? And how long they will stay in China? Will they go to Wuhan? So more questions, more backgrounds about this team will be better. Thank you. Exactly the same answer I will give you. <laughs> they will decide that as soon as they have explored everything and where to focus and how long it will take them and and, and so on. Yeah. They are fully empowered, by the way, and we don't want to treat them as messengers, but experts are fully powered to, uh, you know, operate mm -hmm. based on, uh, you know, the their expertise. Thank you. Yeah, we'll thank you. I could be just, no problem. just possibly add, because I think it's important that the, this mission is a joint WHO China GORN mission. This mission brings together the best of Chinese science, Chinese public health, with the best of the world's science and public yeah. health. And we need to let those experts interact. We need to give them the space, the time to interact, to share information, to check the hypotheses of what's been happening, where this is going. So this is a moment for us to step back and let the scientists do their work um, and uh, and then wait for them to give us the answers they come up with. And we have full faith in our leadership on the ground in doing that. We saw them uh, We saw them off yesterday, actually, last night, and that was what we told them. You're fully powered, you know, you're the experts, and we want you to tell us what the challenges are and working very well with their, of course, counterparts in China. So um, that's what we told them. Our only message was to just work as experts and see what they can see and recommend what they want to recommend based on the situation they see. And I think that's what you would expect. We'll take two more questions from here. We have three more questions here. We have Bloomberg, and then we'll go back online. Yes, please. Jing Hao from China Radio International. Good afternoon, Dr. Tedros. So about the Global Research and Innovation Forum, uh, it's a good opportunity to have the experts together. So what's your expectation for this two days f meeting? And uh, could you mention a little bit more about the program and about the roadmap research? Thank you. Would you like to say? Yeah, we can. Um, the the DJ may, may follow up. He has uh, he will be addressing the conference and and uh, giving the conference its marching orders <laughs> tomorrow morning. But uh, what we really need to focus on tomorrow, and this is a big gathering, and it's uh, obviously uh, again we 
uh, recognised the tremendous work done both within the Secretariat but with a whole series of external partners, both uh, funding partners, scientific partners, to bring this meeting together. This is an amazing initiative to centralise our knowledge. Uh, and we need to be able to identify not only what we know, but ad ad clearly identifying the gaps. But more importantly, what are the specific research priorities? And then how do we accelerate and generate the scientific information for the most needed interventions in diagnostics, medical therapeutics, vaccines, and understanding of the origin of the disease? So the outcome will be a research roadmap, which clearly identifies those priorities uh, and identifies a framework for governing that in terms of how are those priorities going to be turned into product profiles? How are those product profiles going to be turned into products? How is that going to be financed? Who is going to have access to the products that come from that process? How are we going to ensure equitable access on the basis of need to those products? So this isn't just a simply a scientific dis discourse. There are big issues to do with how that whole process is governed, and the DG has been very clear that we need to have a broader process that defines those outcomes as well, so that the, the results of this process uh, are available to all. And uh, as you can imagine, that's a, we're, the, the journey doesn't start tomorrow. It's already begun. But bringing everybody together, I think, will give us a leapfrog moment in terms of coherence, uh, priority setting, and then setting that roadmap so we all travel that road together in the coming months. DG? Yeah. No, thank you. Um, you know, uh, tomorrow's meeting, one thing we would expect is, again, they should be free to say whatever they, they think based on the unknowns we have, but we want them to focus on science. Um, there are some people from some corners who would like to politicize it. I think we have to avoid that. We want scientists who would really focus on the problems and tell us their solutions. So this is science based on evidence and we're expecting that experts, especially in this area, to join and help us in finding solutions to the unknowns or answers to the unknowns. And that's what I would uh, advise and I'll repeat it uh, tomorrow. Science is science, and we want them to really focus on that. And politicization will not really help us. This is a common enemy. I said it many times. Let's focus on this common enemy against humanity. It attacks any human being. And that's how we should see the threat as one humanity against a virus which we don't know very well. And we need to answer the questions in order to fight it better. And in my speech, I said there are cases now, um, you know, onward transmission that are worrying us. The number of cases are very small, of course. But small cases cannot be a guarantee. Even infection starts from one. And that's why I said it could spark a bigger, bigger fire. And we need to use the window of opportunity that we have now. Because if you compare the number of cases in China and the rest of the world, in the rest of the world, I said it earlier, we don't have more than 319 cases, let's say 300, above 300 cases. This is only a window of opportunity. And we should really work hard as one human race to fight this virus be before it gets out of control. And that's my message. And the other part is, as, as you remember, we traveled to Beijing and we had high level meetings and we agreed on three things. Uh, and one is the strategy, especially focus on the source taking serious measures at the epicenter, at the source, that's the Hubei province. Second is sending experts so that the Chinese and international experts can work together to address the unanswered questions. And third is sharing information. But this message is not just for China, it's for the rest of the world too. 
we, we have to do all three in all uh, countries and that's how we can get better uh, response. If there are cases reported, not only in the 24, but, but others, we have to make sure that to attack at the source and we have to uh, share experience and they have to cooperate with WHO. If we need to send experts to other countries, they should be prepared too. So this is a message for, for the whole world and a message that this is a common enemy that we can only defeat if we, if we do it in, in unison and in unity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tadros. We have a really time for only uh, three more questions. We'll go to Bloomberg first, and I will go with two questions online. Thank you. Thanks for squeezing in my question. It's Hugo Miller, Bloomberg News. Uh, there was a study out that concluded January 29th that was published today in China. Uh, it's from a pulmonary disease specialist. I think his name is um, Zhang Nanjan. Forgive my pronunciation. Uh, but he said that he concluded that the incubation period, which I think we've typically understood to be up to 14 days, could easily be as long as 24 days. So the question I have for you is whether that, uh, having absorbed that, whether you're considering changing your recommendations on quarantine periods, be it on a cruise ship, be it wherever around the world, by up to you know, another further 10 days. Thank you. At this point, uh, we take all observations uh, obviously very seriously, but there are many, many different observations of length of incubation. And uh, an incubation periods at either end of the spectrum we need to look at very carefully. Uh, a very long incubation period can reflect a double exposure. Uh, we take exposure as a proxy for infection. So we assume this exposure led to the infection. We've seen this in Ebola when we've seen very long incubation periods and then when we investigate we find, oh no, there was a second exposure a week later or two weeks later and that's when the actual infection occurred. So there very often can be outliers uh, and they can be because of uh, the recording of the exposure. Uh, so we need to be really, really careful when we look at outlier figures. The, the median... Uh, incubation period in that study is actually five days and the 24 days is an outlying uh, an outlying observation so the study doesn't conclude that the incubation period is 24 days the study concludes that the median is five but that the uh, the outlying observation is 24 and that needs to be taken seriously but that needs to be taken in the context of all of the other studies so at this point WHO is not considering changing anything but we will consult further and more widely, as we always do. Sylvia, I don't know. We will have two questions from uh, colleagues online. Uh, we start with Sarah Bosley from Guardian. Sarah, can you hear us? Hello, do we have Sarah? Hello. Yes. Hello, can you hear us? Maybe we can go to... Uh, Hello. Yes. Yeah. Sarah, can you hear us? We can hear you. Hello? Yes. <laughs> I don't think she can hear you, Terry. Uh, Chris, maybe, Chris, maybe we can go to try to get uh, uh, our, another, another journalist online uh, from DPA, from German agency. Do we have anyone online? Uh, Kai is online? Oh, okay, we'll take them. Kai Kuferschmidt. Kai, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, thanks for squeezing in my question, Tarek. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the um, about the case definition. So there are reports that the Chinese National Health Commission has changed those, and that basically um, people who test positive for the virus but have no symptoms will no longer be counted as confirmed cases. Is that partly what's behind the the lower numbers we've seen? Do you know anything about this? Well, uh, Kai, tr truthfully, uh, no, we're not aware of that change. We, we will check it out, obviously, but uh, no, we're not aware of any significant change to the case definition, certainly not one that uh, discounts lab confirmed cases if they're not some, no. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to check that out and come back to you. It sounds uh, strange. Okay, well, uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, we will conclude uh, with this, and sorry for all those uh, whose questions have not been answered, but uh, as you know, we have this daily press briefing, so hopefully we will take questions. those questions too. Again, just to remind you that uh, uh, 
uh, audio file will be available immediately after and transcript hopefully will be posted uh, early in the morning. Thank you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Dr.